Good morning. And welcome to God's house for worship. Today is the final Sunday of the church year, a Sunday that is fittingly titled Christ the King Sunday. And so today we recognize that Jesus is just that. He was and he is and he always will be the one true king over all things. But today we don't just recognize that fact, we celebrate it because Jesus always uses his power and authority as king for our benefit, for the forgiveness of our sins and the salvation of our souls. So as we celebrate that today, we'll do so according to the order of service that's printed for you on page one. We'll turn there now and begin with our gathering rite. May God bless us today as he feeds us with his word and sacrament. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. I cry to you, O Lord. O Lord, hear my voice. Let your ears be attentive to my cry for mercy. O Lord, have mercy on me. Our righteous God demands that we obey him perfectly, but we have not done so. Therefore, let us humbly and honestly confess our sins to God. O Lord, we have heard and seen your holy laws, yet we have failed to obey them. Forgive us for the sins we have committed in ignorance and arrogance. Forgive us for the sins we foolishly cling to. Forgive us for our faithless thoughts and intentions. For all these, we deserve nothing but your punishment. We ask you to have mercy on us for Jesus' sake, forgive our sins and spare us from the punishment we deserve. God innocent of all of our sins. He suffered and died on the cross so that we are no longer condemned sinners but redeemed children. He rose again on the third day so that we can have the confidence that we too will rise again and celebrate eternally in heaven. All this our Savior has done for us. Therefore, because of Jesus, we are at peace with God and our sins are gone. Thanks be to God. Put your hope in the Lord, for with the Lord is unfailing love. With him is full redemption. He has redeemed us from all our sins. Amen.
The Lord be with you. Let us pray. Lord Jesus Christ, by your victory, you have broken the power of the evil one. Fill our hearts with joy and peace as we look with hope to that day when every creature in heaven and earth will acclaim you, King of kings and Lord of lords, to your unending praise and glory. For you live and reign with the Father and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. The first lesson for this Christ the King Sunday comes from the Old Testament book of Daniel, chapter 7. These words will also serve as the basis for the sermon this morning. In the first year of Belshazzar, king of Babylon, Daniel had a dream, and visions passed through his mind as he was lying on his bed. He wrote down the substance of his dream. Daniel said, In my vision at night I looked, and there before me were the four winds of heaven churning up the great sea. Four great beasts, each different from the others, came up out of the sea. The first was like a lion, and it had the wings of an eagle. I watched until its wings were torn off, and it was lifted from the ground so that it stood on two feet like a man, and the heart of a man was given to it. And there before me was a second beast, which looked like a bear. It was raised up on one of its sides, and it had three ribs in its mouth between its teeth. It was told, Get up and eat your fill of flesh. After that, I looked, and there before me was another beast, one that looked like a leopard. And on its back it had four wings like those of a bird. This beast had four heads, and it was given authority to rule. After that, in my vision at night I looked, and there before me was a fourth beast, terrifying and frightening and very powerful. It had large iron teeth. It crushed and devoured its victims and trampled underfoot whatever was left. It was different from all the former beasts, and it had ten horns. While I was thinking about the horns, there before me was another horn, a little one, which came up among them. And three of the first horns were uprooted before it. This horn had eyes like the eyes of a man and a mouth that spoke boastfully. As I looked, thrones were set in place, and the Ancient of Days took his seat. His clothing was as white as snow. The hair of his head was was white like wool. His throne was flaming with fire, and its wheels were all ablaze. A river of fire was flowing, coming out from before him. Thousands upon thousands attended him. Ten thousand times ten thousand stood before him. The court was seated, and the books were opened. Then I continued to watch because of the boastful words the horn was speaking. I kept looking until the beast was slain and its body destroyed and thrown into the blazing fire. The other beasts had been stripped of their authority, but were allowed to live for a period of time. In my vision at night I looked, and there before me was one like a son of man, coming with the clouds of heaven. He approached the Ancient of Days and was led into his presence. He was given authority, glory, and sovereign power. All peoples, nations, and men of every language worshipped him. His dominion is an everlasting dominion that will not pass away. And his kingdom is one that will never be destroyed. This is the word of the Lord. The second lesson comes from the New Testament book of Revelation, chapter 1. As John begins his greeting here, he reminds his readers of the God whom they serve, the God who has won their salvation the same God that is your God and my God. John writes, Grace and peace to you from him who is and who was and who is to come, and from the seven spirits before his throne, and from Jesus Christ, who is the faithful witness, the firstborn from the dead, and the ruler of the kings of the earth. 
to him who loves us and has freed us from our sins by his blood and has made us to be a kingdom and priests to serve his God and Father. To him be glory and power forever and ever. Amen. Look, he is coming with the clouds and every eye will see him, even those who pierced him, and all the peoples of the earth will mourn because of him. So shall it be. Amen. I am the Alpha and the Omega, says the Lord God, who is and who was and who is to come, the Almighty. This too is the word of the Lord. Out of respect for the words and works of Jesus, please stand for the reading of the Gospel. The Holy Gospel is recorded for us in St. John's Gospel, chapter 18. As Jesus stands before Pilate, he reminds him exactly who he is and why he was there. He's the King of Truth, there to testify to the truth. Those who listen to the truth, listen to Jesus. John writes, Pilate then went back inside the palace, summoned Jesus, and asked him, Are you the king of the Jews? Is that your own idea, Jesus asked? Or did others talk to you about me? Am I a Jew, Pilate replied? It was your people and your chief priests who handed you over to me. What is it you have done? Jesus said, My kingdom is not of this world. If it were, my servants would fight to prevent my arrest by the Jews. But now my kingdom is from another place. You are a king then, said Pilate. Jesus answered, you are right in saying I am a king. In fact, for this reason I was born, and for this I came into the world, to testify to the truth. Everyone on the side of truth listens to me. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise Praise be to you, O Christ. You may be seated. We continue with the hymn of the day.
Grace and peace to you from God our Father and from our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Amen. The scripture text that we'll focus our time on this morning comes from our first lesson from the prophecies of Daniel chapter 7. My dear brothers and sisters in Christ, our King. It started out really scary. And then it got even scarier. And then all the fear was taken away. In the first year of Belshazzar, king of Babylon, Daniel had a dream, and visions passed through his mind as he was lying on his bed. He wrote down the substance of his dream. Now, if you remember back a few weeks ago, maybe you'll recall that we recently studied the account of three young Israelite men who had been taken into captivity in the superpower of the world, the nation of Babylon. Three men by the name of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Now, those three men were taken into captivity because that's what the Babylonians were doing to all of the lands that they had conquered so that the best and the brightest of those lands could serve them in Babylon. Well, there was another famous young Israelite man who had been taken into captivity alongside those other three men, a young Israelite man by the name of Daniel. And Daniel, just like those other three displaced Israelites, was put into service in Babylon under the Babylonian king. Now, when Daniel arrived in Babylon, he was a young man serving under a king called Nebuchadnezzar. But by the time today's text took place, once young Daniel was now a man of about 65, and he was serving under a different Babylonian king, Nebuchadnezzar's grandson, Belshazzar. So it was at this time that Daniel, who was also a prophet of God, received a series of visions from God. These visions came to Daniel in the form of dreams that passed through Daniel's mind as he was lying on his bed. And as we'll see as we walk through what Daniel wrote down about his dream, these visions summarized what the entire course of history was going to look like from that very moment in time and on into eternity. Let me say that again a little bit slower, because it's easy to miss the weight of that statement. These visions summarized what the entire course of history was going to look like from that very moment in time and on into eternity. You want to talk about heavy and important stuff? This dream was filled with heavy and important stuff. The entire history of the world on into eternity. So what did Daniel see in these visions from God? Well, it started out really scary. Then it got even scarier. And then all the fear was taken away. Let's start with the really scary part. As Daniel began recording what he saw in his vision, he said, In my vision at night I looked... And there before me were the four winds of heaven churning up the great sea. Four great beasts, each different from the others, came up out of the sea. Now, if that wasn't a scary enough start to Daniel's dream, the next four verses give us more details of exactly what those four beasts looked like. The first beast looked like a lion. Daniel said, but it also had the wings of an eagle. So that beast was very powerful indeed, and yet Daniel soon saw that beast get its wings torn off, and it was replaced by a second beast. The second one looked like a bear, Daniel said. It had three ribs in its mouth between its teeth, and in the dream, the bear was told, get up and eat your fill of flesh. So that was a powerful beast too, but even that second beast was soon replaced by a third. The third beast looked like a leopard, Daniel said. It had four wings on its back, and it had four heads, and it was given authority to rule. That third beast was even more powerful than the first two, and yet that third beast was soon replaced by a fourth beast. 
And the fourth beast was so grotesque that Daniel didn't even know what to compare it to as he saw it in his dream. He simply said it was terrifying and frightening and very powerful. It had large iron teeth, it crushed and devoured its victims, and it trampled underfoot whatever was left. You see, Daniel's vision started out really scary. And it wasn't just the beasts that made Daniel's vision scary. Remember, this vision was given to Daniel by God himself. And it summarized what the entire course of history was going to look like from that moment on into eternity. And so the really scary part of the first part of Daniel's vision was what the beasts represented. Later on, we find out that those four beasts represented the next four great world powers that were going to dominate the earth. The first beast, the lion, represented Babylon, the nation that was currently in charge and the one that Daniel was currently serving. But as the vision declares, Babylon's time on top was soon going to be finished. For soon, and really it was only going to happen a few short years after Daniel's vision, soon Babylon was going to be toppled by another great world power. We now know that world power as the empire of the Medes and the Persians. That was represented by the second beast in Daniel's vision, the one that looked like a bear with the ribs between its teeth. But the Medes and the Persians weren't going to dominate forever either. A third beast the one that Daniel said looked like a leopard with wings would soon take over. We now know that as the empire of the Greeks under Alexander the Great and eventually the four kingdoms that made up his empire after Alexander the Great died. That's why that beast had four heads in Daniel's vision. God gets rather specific in his prophecies, don't you think? But even the Greek empire was not going to dominate forever. Do you know who came next? It was the fourth beast in Daniel's vision, the one that was terrifying and frightening and very powerful with large iron teeth. History now knows that beast as the Roman Empire. The Roman Empire that would sure enough be ruling the world about 500 years after Daniel had this vision. The same Roman Empire that would be ruling the world when Jesus himself would be born into the world. Remember, Jesus was born in the Roman-controlled region of Judea in the Roman-controlled little town of Bethlehem. You see, this was heavy and important stuff. In one night, while Daniel was lying on his bed in Babylon, God revealed to him how the next several hundred years of world history was going to play out. Nations would rise and fall. And every time one fell, an even more powerful one would take its place. Heavy and important stuff. And not just heavy and important, scary. There's a reason why all the nations were represented by beasts, after all, in Daniel's vision. It's because all four of these superpowers ruled like, well, like beasts. None of those nations were godly nations. None of the kings or the emperors in charge acknowledged God as the creator and the preserver and the giver of life. And whenever a nation refuses to acknowledge that God is God, they rule like beasts. They only seek to dominate and destroy, eating its fill of flesh, crushing, devouring, trampling its victims underfoot. What a scary thing to be told by God himself that that's how the powers in charge will often act. They did then, and they often do now, like beasts that care nothing about those that they rule, but who only seek to dominate and devour and destroy. God revealed so much of it to Daniel before any of it even came to pass. Daniel's vision started out really scary. But it's clear as the vision continues, isn't it? This vision isn't simply about what the world is like when godless beasts are in charge. 
No, as Daniel's vision continues, God reveals to him another truth that arches over all of it. That even when the powers that are in charge in our world refuse to acknowledge that God is God, God doesn't cease to be God. Instead, all these kingdoms, all these beasts, simply rise and fall under the divine command and plan of the one that Daniel refers to later on in his vision as the ancient of days. That's a reference to God. So yes, kingdoms rise and kingdoms fall. But the ancient of days, the eternal and everlasting God himself, remains in charge of all of it. And soon, all of it will come under his judgment. That's the truth that God makes very clear to Daniel in the second part of his vision. As Daniel continued to write down what he saw in his dreams, he said this in verse 9. He wrote, As I looked, thrones were set in place, and the Ancient of Days took his seat. His clothing was as white as snow. The hair of his head was white like wool. His throne was flaming with fire, and its wheels were all ablaze. A river of fire was flowing, coming out from before him. Thousands upon thousands attended him. Ten thousand times ten thousand stood before him. The court was seated, and the books were opened. The beasts that rise, on, rise and fall on earth are not in charge of how things ultimately go. The Ancient of Days is in charge of how things ultimately go. Always. And that means the beasts that rise and fall on earth aren't in charge of your life or your future or your eternity either, Christians. The Ancient of Days, who doesn't rise and fall, but who remains the one and only king over all of it, he's ultimately in charge of your life and your future and your eternity. So, what does he say will happen here in this vision that covers the rest of eternity? God himself says that when all the rising and the falling of the kingdoms of men is done, the Ancient of Days will take his seat as judge over all of it. And that means the Ancient of Days will take his seat as judge over you. And he says all the books will be opened and you will be judged. And not with a judgment that's going to be determined by a Babylonian king or a Roman emperor or by any other earthly judge or authority, but by a judgment that's going to be determined by the Ancient of Days himself. Are you understanding more about the vision now? It started out really scary with the beasts, but now it gets even scarier. Because standing in judgment before the judgment seat of the Ancient of Days, who describes himself here as white as snow and white like wool, who sits on a flaming throne with a river of fire flowing from it, this vision tells us exactly who our eternal God is. He's pure and he's holy and he refuses to endure the sight of any unholiness and sin in his presence. Instead, any sin that comes into his presence rightly deserves to fall under his fiery judgment and be condemned. Can any of us possibly survive this future moment in time then? Remember, this vision summarized what the entire course of history was going to look like from this very moment in time and on into eternity. And so that means this future moment is coming, and it's coming for us all. We're all going to stand before the eternal and everlasting God, the Ancient of Days, to be judged. The books will be opened, a verdict will be read, 
and our eternity will be sealed. Well, wretched sinners that we are, how can any of us possibly stand before the Ancient of Days on that day and live? It would have been better to be thrown into the hands of the beasts. Daniel's vision started out really scary with the beasts, but now, now it gets even scarier. And then, all the fear is taken away. Do you see how it all culminates at the end of Daniel's vision? In verse 13, someone new steps into the scene. And this one isn't a beast. No, this one, Daniel says, was one like a son of man. And this one didn't come out of the sea, that is, out of the world where all the beasts came from. No, this one came with the clouds of heaven, Daniel said. And this one, like a son of man, approached the Ancient of Days and was led into his presence. And then, in the midst of this eternal, overarching panorama of all history, the most amazing thing happens. The Ancient of Days hands all of his authority over to him. This one like a son of man was given authority, glory, and sovereign power, Daniel saw. And so it would be this one, this one like a son of man, he would now be pronouncing the verdicts. He would now be announcing the judgments on behalf of the Ancient of Days. So who is this one like a son of man? We hear about him every week when we gather together here in the Lord's house. We met him again in today's gospel. And it's ironic, isn't it? The conversation that the son of man was having. This one who was prophesied about here, this one like a son of man, he was standing before a governor in the Roman Empire. That is the empire that's described in the vision as the beast with the iron teeth. That Roman governor who was supposed to be in charge asked this one like a son of man, are you the king of the Jews? And then the son of man responded, my kingdom is not of this world. My kingdom is from another place. You are a king then, the governor responded. And then the son of man said, you are right in saying that I am a king. And then that king, the one who had a kingdom, but one that was not of this world, was sentenced to death by crucifixion on a cross. And not because this Roman governor who was in charge sentenced him to death against his will, but instead because this one like a son of man, this one who had been given all authority and glory and sovereign power, he was sentenced to death because he willingly accepted that sentence of death of his own accord. He willingly accepted it so that he could face the verdict that we deserved for our sins, so that he could face the punishment that we deserved for our sins. He did it so that we could one day stand before the Ancient of Days and hear the Son of Man himself, the one who now has the authority to announce the verdict. He did it so that we can one day hear him say, you are not guilty anymore. All of your sins have been paid for, taken care of, washed away by me. And that means you're a part of my kingdom now, the king will say to you on that day. And my kingdom? My kingdom doesn't rise and fall like all the kingdoms of the world. No, my kingdom? Well, what did Daniel say in the vision? The kingdom of Christ is an everlasting kingdom. It will not pass away, and it will never be destroyed. You're a part of that kingdom now. 
And so all the fear is taken away. I suppose what we covered in the last 20 minutes sounds rather dramatic. Well, it's a dramatic story. God revealed to Daniel in one night while he was lying on his bed in Babylon what was going to happen in the entire course of history from that very moment in Daniel's life and on into eternity. It was heavy and important stuff. And it started out really scary, the beasts. Then it got even scarier, standing before the holy and pure ancient of days to be judged. But then, because of Christ, our King, the one who has paid for all of our sins, the one who has already pronounced you not guilty through faith in him, the one who has brought you to be a part of his kingdom forever. Because Christ is our king, all the fear is taken away. So what now? Well, we're part of the vision too. Did you notice that? We are right there in verse 14. We're there standing before Christ our King, worshiping. So now, we worship. We worship Christ our King alongside all the peoples and nations and men of every language who call this Son of Man King along with us. We worship him by serving him now until we get to worship him in glory at his side for eternity. Christ is our king, dear Christians, eternal and everlasting. He's paid for your sins. He's declared you not guilty before God, the ancient of days, and now he has brought you in to his kingdom forever. Because Christ is our king, he has taken away all of our reasons to fear. Amen. And now may the peace of our God, which surpasses all understanding, guard your hearts and your minds through faith in Christ Jesus. Amen. Let's turn to page six of our service folder. We'll continue with the final two stanzas of our hymn response, Crown Him with Many Crowns. Between stanzas three and four, we'll stand. And I'll invite you to stand during that interlude. be seated. If you have a physical offering that you'd like to give today, you can do so in one of the baskets on the way out of the sanctuary. We'll now continue with our prayer of the church, followed by the Lord's Prayer on page 6. When it comes to time for special prayers, 
uh, during the prayer of the church, we remember in our prayers Christina Knapp, who's dealing with an infection in her blood and receiving treatment at the hospital. Let us pray. To him who sits on the throne and to the Lamb be praise and honor and glory and power forever and ever. Let us rejoice and be glad and give him the glory. You are worthy, O Christ, our King, to receive honor and glory and praise. For you created all things, and by your will they were created and have their being. You are worthy, O Christ, our King, to receive honor and glory and praise because you were slain, and with your blood you purchased us for God. From every tribe and language and people and nation, you have called us into your kingdom and have made us priests to serve you, our God and Father. We give you thanks, O Christ, our shepherd king, because you have searched for us and found us. Lead us to the green pastures and quiet waters of your saving love, so that we may enjoy peace and comfort for our souls. Heal our hearts when they are broken with sin and guilt. Strengthen us when we are weak. We give you thanks, Lord God Almighty, because you have taken your great power and have begun to reign. Come with your mighty power to break and defeat every evil plan and purpose of the devil, of the ungodly influences and ideas of the world, and of our own sinful nature. Use your power to calm the unrest among nations and peoples so that your kingdom may spread and grow. Strengthen our confidence in knowing that your kingdom will never be destroyed. O Christ, our King, you have supremacy over all. You will judge the world in righteousness and the peoples with equity. You have destroyed death and brought life and immortality to light through the gospel. Reign in our hearts so that we may serve you more faithfully and speak more boldly to others of your saving love. Praise be to the Lord God who alone does marvelous deeds. May the whole earth be filled with his glory. O oh Lord, you are the great physician of soul and body. You chasten and you heal. We pray that you would look with mercy on Christina in her illness. If it is your will, restore her strength. You gave your son to bear our infirmities and sicknesses. Deal compassionately with your servant and bless the medical means employed on her behalf with your healing power. We commit her to your gracious mercy and protection, for you are the faithful and merciful God. Hear us, Lord, as we bring you our private petitions. Look, he is coming with the clouds, and every eye will see him, even those who pierced him. The kingdom of the world has become the kingdom of our Lord and of his Christ, and he will reign forever and ever, King of kings and Lord of lords. The Lord God Almighty reigns. Let us rejoice and be glad and give him the glory. Amen. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. The Lord be with you. And also with you. Lift up your hearts. We lift them up to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. Praise to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. In love, he has blessed us with every spiritual blessing. He protects and preserves his church in every age and gives us confidence 
to lift up our heads and watch for Jesus with joy. Therefore, with all the saints on earth and hosts of heaven, we praise your holy name and join their glorious song. Holy, 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 Lord God of heavenly hosts, heaven and earth are full of your glory. Hosanna in the highest. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. Our Lord Jesus Christ, on the night he was betrayed, took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take and eat. This is my body, which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And he took the cup, gave thanks, and gave it to them, saying, Drink from it, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant, which is poured out for you for the forgiveness of sins. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. In the peace of the Lord be with you always. Amen. O Christ, Lamb of God, you take away the sin of the world. Have mercy on us and grant us your peace. Amen. For the distribution of the Lord's Supper, we follow the principles that God lays out in his word, which are laid out for you there in your worship folder. We ask only those who are in fellowship with us, another Wells Church or ELS congregation, come forward for the Lord's Supper. Come, for all things are now ready.
Let us pray. Hear the prayer of your people, O Lord, that the lips which have praised you here may glorify you in the world, that the eyes which have seen the coming of your Son may long for his coming again, and that all who have received in his true body and blood the pledge of your forgiveness may be restored to live a new and holy life. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Amen. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord look upon you with his favor and give you his peace. Amen. We close with the closing hymn on the back of your worship folder. Good morning once again. It's good to be here with you this morning and worship our King alongside you. A couple of no announcements this morning. Thank you, Julianne, for playing. Um, also, Thanksgiving uh, service on Wednesday night. Most of the calendars have that at 6.30. That is correct. 6.30 p.m. on Wednesday night Thanksgiving service. So make sure you note that. Um, 
Bible class in Sunday school as normal. Bible class down in the fellowship hall, Sunday school over in the school. And maybe now would be a good time to talk about Bible class the next couple of weeks for you. Um, today we're going to finish up with Matthew Bible study. Um, God willing, we'll finish up with that. And then next week we're going to stop. <laughs> next week we're going to start with uh, the new hymnal study. I didn't mean anything by that. I really didn't. <laughs> Um, next week, we're going to start off with our new hymnal study. So we'll be diving into about, in, over the next four weeks after this week, leading up to Christmas, we'll dive into about 20-ish of the new hymns that are in the new hymnal that aren't in the supplement or in the red hymnal as we know it. Um, brand new hymns to us. So we're going to study those. We're going to dive into the Bible passages uh, that support those and why we sing hymns in general and we're proclaiming things to each other when we sing. Uh, so that's kind of going to be the, what we're going to be doing, looking into the new hymnal, for familiarizing ourselves with that hymnal, as that's going to be our hymnal for the foreseeable future now uh, here at Zion. Um, and also with that, um, Sunday school, there will be ne no Sunday school during that time. Sunday schoolers are encouraged and really, really encouraged to come with your family. This will be a family thing, uh, singing hymns as a family, getting to know the hymnal together, um, be like a... Should be a fun family thing to do. Let's see, anything else? Zion update. Anything else that you might need to know will be in the Zion update. So make sure you're checking that. Nothing else that I'm aware of. So God bless your week as you live in the, the comfort of what your king has done for you.